Welcome to the Peace Haven Weekly Podcast. Weekly message audio from Peace Haven Baptist Church in North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. We begin our study in Romans, with this sermon entitled, An Overview of Romans. We thank you for listening and be sure to visit us at www.findpeace.today. So good morning, and I know everyone's belly is full now. Um, and so, hopefully we, we don't all fall asleep because we're full. Amanda said I needed um, a hand sign, so uh, Romans, there you go. Um, but we, uh, I hope everyone enjoyed our, our walk through the Bible um, series that we did. And I'm excited to be going through Romans. And I can't see where, is this on the title one? Okay, so I'm going to keep my computer here and I'll have to to do both so I'll know where we're at. But uh, this morning I am very excited um, about this series, but I'm excited about this morning. Um, I just wanted to begin by giving us some background information, connecting some some dots, uh, maybe showing some things that maybe we haven't thought about before or uh, didn't connect the links together in, in Scripture. Um, I don't know. I, my mind is, is not that good from when I was in elementary school, but um, I think sometimes we look at the Bible like it's is it Milton Harris or somebody that used to make textbooks, um, and, and we think of it like this textbook that somebody put together and, and, and it's just for, for study, but we forget that it's, especially in the New Testament, they, these are, are letters that people were writing to other believers and um, they're, they're real and, and you can miss their realness. Um, I think sometimes you can miss the heart if you disconnect that this is a, a letter that somebody is writing people that he loves. Paul loves the Roman people and he is writing from his heart to, uh, to share some, some good news, some bad news, well, as we'll see. Um, but hopefully this morning as we think about this, it's uh, just a reminder that these are real people. These were real places, real events that were happening uh, at the time and, and hopefully put as much flesh on Paul's bones as we can uh, this morning. And so uh, the timestamp of Paul's life is found in Acts 18. And so I put together, I hope that you can see this well, uh, I put together kind of a a timeline of his life. And and again, these are kind of approximate dates, uh, but the timestamp of of his life that we we can say, okay, this is when this happened around this time for sure uh, is in Acts 18, where Paul is charged before uh, Gallio, he's the, the prom school uh, proconsul of Achaia, and he is, uh, Paul stands before him because the, the Jewish people were angry with Paul and accused him of, of persuading people to follow uh, a different God. And so uh, Galileo hears his case somewhere around 50 or to 54 AD is when he uh, was proconsul of Achaia. And so that's a, a date we can kind of stamp that and say, okay, this is when that would have had to happen. Um, and when that takes place in Acts 18, uh, Paul has already completed two of his three missionary journeys at this point in his life. Um, the combined time of, of those two prior journeys was uh, about three to four years he had spent in, uh, on his first and second missionary journey. And then before those two missionary journeys, uh, if you recall the, the timeline of events in Acts, um, Paul had spent three years in Arabia uh, and in Damascus uh, studying the Old Testament after his conversion. Uh, you remember, hopefully... In Acts, where, where Paul is on the, the road to Damascus and he's actually going there to uh, persecute Christians. And he has this uh, vision and hears the voice of, of Jesus on his way to Damascus and he loses his sight. And so he has to go there uh, to get his sight restored. And, and so Paul is converted in this dynamic way. And, and for the next three years, he doesn't run back to Jerusalem um, because he, he's been persecuting the church and, and he's wanting to make things sure that. Uh, he can see this in the Old Testament. 
And so he spends three years studying the scriptures to see how um, the, the law, uh, the writings, the prophets, the Psalms, they all point to the Messiah, who is Jesus. And so he studies there for three years. Um, and then before that, he spent an undefined time persecuting uh, the church. Paul was a uh, rising Pharisee. A lot of people believe that he was on track to become part of the Sanhedrin, um, which would have been the, uh, the council that would have stood up in judgment over the, the Jewish people when they had problems. They would go to those, uh, that Sanhedrin, that court of men. And then before that, he spent several years uh, studying under Rabbi Gamaliel, um, and that would have been during Paul's teens and, and 20s. Um, if we look at the, the Mishnah, which is the oral tradition of the, did that work? Is my slides working? Okay. Uh, if we look at the Mishnah, the oral traditions of Judaism, it states that at five years old, one is fit for scripture. At 10, the Mishnah, or that oral tradition. At 13 years, for the fulfilling of commandments. At 15, the, the Talmud, and that would have been the uh, rabbinic, rabbinical interpretations of the Torah. Uh, and then at 18, fit for the bride chamber. At 20, for pursuing a vocation. And then at 30, for uh, having authority or being able to uh, teach and have disciples under them. And so from those acts, events, we can kind of guesstimate uh, that Paul was born around 10 years after Jesus. Uh, give or take five years. Uh, and so Paul was probably in his late teens or early 20s during Jesus's ministry. Uh, he's not old enough to speak with authority. He's not in his 30s yet. Uh, he's not really old enough to, to challenge um, Jesus during his ministry. We're not really sure if he ever um, physically saw Jesus before the, the road to Damascus event or, or heard Jesus, but he probably heard about this uh, rabbi in, in the area of Galilee and, and uh, some of the commotion that he was causing in the, the Jewish community. And so uh, eventually Paul does uh, begin to rise in the ranks of the Pharisees and begins persecuting the church. And so if he's born around 10 years after Jesus, um, when he begins persecuting the church, he would have been around 30 years old. And that kind of matches of the time frame of when he would have been uh, trying to make a, a name for himself. And so in Acts, again, we see that um, he uh, approves of Stephen stoning and he's standing there holding the coats of the Sanhedrin uh, while they stone Stephen. And so we see him beginning to make a name for himself. And then shortly after uh, the stoning of, of Stephen, he asked for permission from the Jewish high, Jewish high priest um, to get papers to go into different synagogues and, and round up these people that belonged to what then was known as the way. Um, Christianity wasn't called Christianity until later, but th there was this movement called uh, the way. And so he's asking if he could round up people that belong to the way. Uh, and then he is converted on the road to Damascus and spent those three years studying the Old Testament, seeing how the Old Testament points to Christ. And then finally, he, uh, after those three years, returns to Jerusalem uh, to make amends with the disciples and really to um, authenticate his conversion uh, because they would have been afraid of, of him and what he had been saying, what he had been trying to do. And so he goes to the disciples to show, hey, Jesus has, has changed my life. I'm, I'm a believer now. Uh, he spoke to me, and this is what he's, he's told me. And uh, so he goes to the disciples in Jerusalem. And then after that, Paul starts on his missionary journeys. And so his first missionary journey, um, he leaves Antioch around 49 A.D. Uh, for a one-year trip. And he goes to Salamis. Perga, you can see Salamis is on that little island called uh, Cyrus. Uh, he goes from there to Perga and then to uh, Antioch in Galatia, not Antioch in Jerusalem, um, and then to Iconium and, and Derbe. And so this is the area of Galatia or Asia Minor. And then he, after that, he, he returns and is, is going out on his second missionary journey. Um, here he leaves from Jerusalem 
uh, about 50 AD for a two year trip and he travels back through uh, the area of a Asia Minor into Greece. And so now Paul spends some time in Athens and, and Corinth and really uh, quite a bit of time in, in Corinth. And so it's here in Corinth that he is introduced to um, two special people uh, named Priscilla and Aquila. And we find that in Acts 18. Uh, they have come to Corinth, Luke writes, from Italy uh, because of a decree from Emperor Claudius. And, and you can look through history and you can find when Emperor Claudius reigned. Um, I think he came into power around 49 AD, somewhere around there. Um, but he... Emperor Claudius uh, sent out a decree in Rome because the Jewish people and the Jewish Christians, um, Rome didn't really differentiate between the two. They just considered them all Jewish people. Um, they began to uh, have debates and, and division and, and kind of fighting um, over someone named Crestus is what the historical documents we have say. And so uh, a lot of people think that mention of, of Christus is really uh, a reference to Christ um, or Christus. And, and so um, even Christ is recorded here in, in historical records. And so anyway, there's this division that happens there in Rome. And so all of the Jews and those Jewish Christians are, are exiled from Rome for a while. And Paul, after meeting them and spending some time there, he returns back to Antioch. Uh, and if you remember when we studied Ephesians, he, he promised the Ephesians, uh, hey, I have to, to go back for a little bit, but I'm going to come back and I'm going to, to spend some time with you. And so that's when Paul begins his third missionary journey. Um, Paul leaves Antioch around 52 AD. Uh, this time his trip will last three years. Uh, he spends the majority of his time in Ephesus, as we talked about in our, our study of Ephesians. He was there for uh, about two years, a little over two years. And he goes back to Corinth. And so in Corinth, Paul writes his letter to the Romans. And he will send the letter by uh, a woman named Phoebe. And we see this at the end of the letter. He um, tells the, the people in Rome to commend Phoebe. Uh, their sister in Christ. Uh, Phoebe is from Cancrea, uh, a seaport in the city of Corinth. Um, we see that in Romans 16. And, and what's really cool is since Claudius, during this time, uh, he is poisoned and he's killed. Uh, so since Claudius is dead, uh, Priscilla and Aquila have moved back to Rome. And so at the end of Paul's letter, he says, uh, come in. Phoebe, our, our sister, and then say hey to uh, Priscilla and Aquila for me. And as I saw that this week, I loved it. Because this is, this is just like you and I, if we were writing, uh, I know we don't write a lot of letters these days, but if we were writing and we said, hey, you know, uh, my family that used to live here, they've moved back. Um, home to some other family and I'm writing a letter to uh, my grandmother and so grandma hey tell uh, Uncle Lou and Aunt Sally that I, I said hello and so this is this is real it's real and and when you see that and you see these connections I, I get excited about it. it it might be because I'm a nerd but I, I loved that uh, this week and, and seeing how they had moved back um, and Paul uh, he had such a heart for them that he sends them greetings. And so Paul explains at the end of Romans that his mission in Asia Minor and Greece are, uh, he considers them completed. He says, I've done all I can do. Churches have been established in those areas. And so now I've turned my sights to Spain. I want to go to Spain and I want those people to have the gospel. And so uh, I haven't been back to Rome uh, because we know Paul was a Roman citizen, but uh, I haven't been to Rome and seen the, the church in Rome and those believers there. But on my way to Spain, I'm going to go to Spain through Rome. And so I, I want to come and visit you there. However, that isn't how things shake out. While Paul is in Jerusalem at the end of his third missionary journey, uh, things start to, to go crazy. He is accused of teaching against the Jews, against the, the law, against the temple. 
And he is also accused of bringing a Gentile, Trophimus, um, who came from Ephesus, uh, into the temple. And so an angry mob breaks out and a uh, Roman soldier arrests Paul to try to keep the peace. And so the, this soldier that arrests Paul, he allows him to, uh, he allows Paul to speak to the Jews. And Paul does so in, in Hebrew. And they start getting crazy again. And they are calling for him to be killed. And so the, the soldier, not knowing what Paul said, since he can't speak Hebrew, he takes him uh, back to prison. He begins to uh, question Paul. He's going to, to flog him. He gets the whips out and says, okay, we're, gonna, we're going to take information from him one way or another. So if we have to beat him to get what he said to those people, we'll do that. And so uh, before he does that, Paul says, wait a second. I'm a Roman citizen. You, you can't do this to me. And so the soldier basically says, uh-oh, uh, what am I going to do? And, and so Paul, since he is a Roman citizen, he has to have a, a fair trial. And it is arranged that Paul will stand before the governor to stand trial. And so he stands first before uh, Governor Felix, who says, after hearing Paul's testimony and hearing the gospel, says, well, listen, I, I need some time to think about this. I'll get back to you. He, he never does. And so a new governor comes into power. Um, Felix really kept Paul in prison for, for two years, never really got back to him. Uh, as a favor for the Jews so they would see him in, in good light. Uh, and meanwhile, the, the Jewish people are devising a way to, to kill Paul. They say, um, since, since the prison was not in Jerusalem, uh, they say, if, if we can get Paul to come back to Jerusalem, if we can get him to agree to come to, to Jerusalem to stand trial, we'll kill him on the way back. And then that'll be the end of it. And so uh, a new governor, Festus, comes into power. And he tries to get Paul to agree to go back to, 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 to Jerusalem. He's in on the plan of, of the Jewish people. Um, Paul sees through the plan and says, no, I'm not going back to Jerusalem. I appeal to Caesar. So he uh, appeals to the highest power in the land. And so that is when Paul is finally sent to Rome, but he doesn't go the way he expected. Um, he goes in uh, as a prisoner uh, to stand trial before Caesar on the way. I've got it highlighted or circled in red on that map. That's where Paul would have been uh, shipwrecked for a time. But he finally does make it to Rome and he is uh, in Rome under house arrest. And so this is where Paul would write his pastoral epistles, uh, Philemon, Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians. And then things kind of start to, to get fuzzy. Uh, it seems that Paul was released, most likely released around 62 A.D., and then uh, he, he, there's some activity uh, and he is imprisoned again in 65 AD. And that is when he would have written his final letters to Timothy and Titus. And then eventually he becomes a martyr in 66 AD. He's killed by the emperor Nero. And so um, that's some, some history in the timeline of, of Paul there and, and Romans. Uh, Romans is a unique letter. Uh, there's a, a lot of depth that we're going to have to dive into. Um, it's unique because one reason is, is that Paul is not responding to a specific uh, situation or circumstance that he has heard about in the, the church. Um, in his letter to the, the Galatians, he uh, addresses the, the Judaizers and he talks about how to, to handle those uh, people, that group of people. In Corinthians, he addresses the uh, unity and the sanctification of, of that church and so addresses some very specific sins that he has heard about uh, at that church. And then in Romans, um, we, we get more of a, a big mixture of things. There's some theology in Romans. There's some philosophy. Uh, and then there's some practical application. And uh, I found a, a quote as I was studying by Randall D. Smith that I enjoyed. It says, Romans is like... An attorney's closing argument. It is a capsulized form of what the gospel is, why the gospel came, and how the gospel is to be lived. And so I really feel like I'm doing too many sermons this morning, but that was my first one. And, and now quickly we're going to uh, look at five boxes, five stages of, of this letter. And so this is where we're kind of looking at, at Romans from 3,000 feet. And so the, the first stage or the first box we're going to look at 
um, is condemnation. The first three chapters of uh, the letter uh, are about condemnation. Then that is followed by chapters four and five about justification of their salvation. And then chapters six through eight are about sanctification. Then chapters nine through 11 are about vindication. And then 12 through 16 are about application. And so I'll kind of explain what those mean as we go through this this morning really quickly. Uh, but Paul begins with condemnation. That is, that's the, uh, the first three, what we call chapters of, of his letter. And so after his general greeting, Paul has some very urgent and devastating news. And, and I, I can't emphasize this enough. This is a really big uh-oh moment. The first three chapters of this book are going to be very heavy. And Paul means for them to be that way. Because without Jesus, guys, we're in big trouble. And Paul wants us to see that. Um, I heard a, a preacher one time, and I know you've probably heard it say, we, we can't get saved until we realize we're lost. We're hopeless. We need a Savior. And Paul wants to make that very clear as he opens up his letter. And so Romans 1 Basically, Paul says God's wrath has been revealed in heaven because we know he exists, yet we ignored him. And he'll say that God created the universe so that we would revere someone that is greater than we are. Someone who is more significant than ourselves, but we have declared mutiny against our creator. And we worship the creature and the gifts rather than the creator and the giver. Since we don't honor and acknowledge God or, or uh, our thinking has become confused, our thinking has become disordered. And so we are godless in our thinking and lawless in our actions. And Paul wants to make that very clear that all of us are under this condemnation. We are content to live that way, not only accepting unrighteousness, but celebrating it. And then Paul moves on in Romans 2 and says, we stand before God. When we stand before God, we will have no excuse because we are all guilty. He'll say that we know that we're guilty because our own conscience condemns us. Because we all make judgments about things in our life. We all make decisions. And so that proves that we have a sense of what is right and what is wrong. Yet the standard that we create for other people and say they did that, they're wrong. We can't keep that same standard ourselves. And so we hold people to a higher standards than what, we, than what we will keep ourselves. And so we're guilty. No one has lived like they know they should. The non-religious person has failed to live up to the standards of conscience, and the religious person has failed to live up to the standards of God's law. Paul moves on in Romans 3 and says that God's righteous standard is not a sliding scale. It's perfection or, or nothing. And we can't do better. We can't try harder. We are at the mercy of the court. And then Paul moves into good news. The court is merciful. God is a God of mercy. And there is a principle higher than the law that condemns us. And that is the principle of faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul spends the following two chapters after that explaining how Jesus' work can save us. In Romans 4, Paul says that salvation through faith alone is not a new idea. It was an Old Testament staple. And he demonstrates that by speaking of Abraham and Sarah who were unable to have children. And so God promised to make them a great nation. And Abraham and Sarah were old. They were as good as dead, the Bible says. They couldn't try harder to make themselves young again. But Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. He believed that God could bring death from life. Life from death. He believed that what was barren in, in Sarah's womb could be made fruitful. And we have to think about that and that language and what that is. That's giving us a picture. It's so cool that what was barren and dead is now becoming fruitful. And that's the Christian life. That's faith and trust in God. And so Romans 5, Paul says, by faith, we can be forgiven. We can have peace with God through Jesus because Jesus died so that we could be forgiven from the penalty of sin. And then he rose again so we could be delivered from the power of sin over our lives. 
And at this point, Paul begins to assume that if you're reading this letter, you've had a chance to respond to the gospel by faith. And so Paul continues. Romans 6, he says that grace is not a license for sin and, and disobedience. That just because you uh, have put your trust in Christ doesn't mean that we, can't, that we can live however we want to live. Paul says that there is freedom in Jesus, but it's not a freedom to live however we want. We were already doing that. That's Paul's point. We were slaves to sin. We were slaves to our desires and our passion. And now our lives have a new course. Our lives are put on a, a new trajectory. We are to, to live increasingly holy lives. And that doesn't mean perfection. Paul will we'll talk about that. But it does mean progress. So we should never have an excuse for sin. Here's kind of Paul's bottom line. We should never have an excuse for sin. But we should always have an apology for sin. And so in Romans 7, Paul gives us some illustrations to kind of help us understand what he's talking about. And he gives the example of a, a marriage contract that is no longer binding upon death of a spouse. And then he starts to use the language of war. That there is presently a conflict going on between our flesh and our spirit. And then in Romans 8, Paul will say, even though my flesh often wins and I sin, I stand uncondemned. And then that begs the question, how, Paul? And Paul will say, because Jesus has done for me, Jesus has done for you what we could not do for ourselves. Paul has such a pastor's heart here. He says, basically, by the way, guys, I, I know, I know life is hard. I know that you may sin. I know that your situations and some of the things that happen in our lives, they will get us discouraged. We get discouraged by our, our circumstances. And guys, I, I know that you may even be suffering for your faith. But listen, no one can condemn you. And no one can separate you from the love of God because God is faithful. It's a beautiful chapter, Romans 8. Then in Romans 9 through 11, Paul now uh, answers some questions that he knows will arise in his audience's mind. The question is, what about Israel? You, you can't just write off two-thirds of the Bible. Israel is, is kind of a big deal in the Old Testament. So what about Israel? Has God, is God, will God keep his promises to Israel? Because Paul, when we look around, in Rome, the, the church is becoming increasingly Gentile. So what's going on with the Jewish people? What's happening with Israel? And so in chapter 9, Paul talks about Israel's past. In chapter 10, he talks about Israel in the present, in Paul's day. And then in chapter 11, he talks about Israel's future, Israel after the time of Paul. And we'll, we'll dig into those. Those are hard chapters, but we're going to dig into those. And having addressed the question of Israel, Paul ends his letter with applications. In Romans 12, Paul says, what does the, the Christian life look like in, in daily life? Again, it's a daily struggle. It's a, a daily awareness and, and commitment. And we're reminded to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, offer our whole self to God. And how cool that we've been through Leviticus and we can understand that idea of a thank offering and a whole burnt offering of offering ourselves to God. And then in Romans 13, he says, this is what that looks like under earthly governing authorities. It's true that we are under God's authority and belong to his eternal kingdom. But God has also ordained earthly governing authorities for a purpose. And so as Christians, we are to respect and, and honor those authorities. Authorities. In Romans 14, he says, this is what that looks like in matters of conscience. Again, that's a tough chapter. Um, and it may come to a surprise to us Baptists, um, but we aren't always going to agree on everything. Surprise. Um, and Paul anticipates this and, and wants to talk about it. So he talks about uh, how do we maintain unity when our opinions, and that, that's the key word there, when our opinions differ. Then Paul begins to wrap things up in Romans 15. And Paul says that we should seek unity 
over personal comfort and everybody's toes get simultaneously stomped on at the same time um, because we're selfish. And Paul says we should seek unity over personal comfort in our relationships. Are, are we consumers or are we investors? Are we about tearing others down so we can look high and mighty and holier than thou? Or are we about pouring ourselves out for others for their best interest? And then Paul says, uh, say hey to all my friends. I love that. Uh, this is not a, a textbook, guys. It, it's a letter. These are real people. This is real space and time. This is real history. And I love the ending because it reminds me of how I became a Christian. I grew up in church. I had godly parents that took me to Sunday school and brought me to church. And a lot of my teachers are have gone on to be with the Lord, but I, I was the nerdy kid that knew the Bible trivia. I, I won the, the candy every week. That's why I'm fat. Uh, uh, I, I knew the trivia. I could answer the questions, but I didn't know Jesus. Until there was this, I, I call it a lot more moment. I call it a moment of where I said, Eureka, because I realized that this is real. This is not just something that we do. This is not something I should just memorize and, and know to make my mom and dad a happy. These are, my life is not based on choices just to make my parents happy. There's a God that loves me. And he really did send his son to die for me because I needed that. I needed a savior. It was like a, a light switch. And I didn't say some kind of magic prayer. I did pray. I did talk to God. And I, I remember the conversation because some of you know me, for I can attest. When, when I was growing up in church, I, I always questioned. I had been to the altar. I, I had done that plenty of times. But at night when I would lay down, I, I would think, you know, did, did I cry enough? Was I really sorry enough? Did I, did I say the right thing? And, and I was putting all this trust in what I did. And I went through several seasons of ups and downs and ups and downs. And I, finally, I was at the end of my rope. And, and I said, God, you know, I'm, I'm tired. I'm tired of not knowing. Tired of always questioning me. And as I sat there, he, he said, Listen, just give it to me. I've done it. Just trust me. Give it to me. And the lights which went off. I said, It's yours. It's yours. And that is the day that I was born again. I still have seasons where I get discouraged, but I, I, I don't question that. I don't question that because God is faithful. And I love the realness of this letter because that's how I got saved, by seeing the realness of it. When I saw that realness, when I saw that new reality now daily, my life is, is lived in that new reality. And these people that Paul is writing to in Rome, they had the same struggles, they had obstacles, they had questions. And we, all of us, are, are connected to them through this letter that, that Paul wrote and through our, our common faith in our Savior. And so this isn't just continuing a tradition. This is being part of an authentic, expanding kingdom of people that, are, that have entered into a, a new reality. We've seen what Jesus has done. We have seen what God has done through Jesus. And we've trusted Him by faith. And so we've entered into that new reality. And, and I'll, I'll just close by saying, I, I hope that's all of us. I hope that each person sitting here that's hearing me this morning has entered into that reality. 
and just trusted what Jesus has done for you by faith. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And uh, I just thank you for your goodness, that goodness that we sing about this, this morning. And if we really just stop, think about those words, all my life, you have been faithful. God, we love you. We thank you for sending your son. I thank you for these people here this morning. I pray that as we study together, that you will show us your glory and be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.